If you want to meet a truly conscious entrepreneur, then look no further than my friend Keith Roberts. Keith is an exited founder. He's the creator of the Oak Journal and co-author of a book that just came out recently called The Eternal Flame, Ancient Wisdom for Today's Modern Leader. And recently, this is amazing, uh, Keith and his co-author of that book, Ryan Avery, set a Guinness World Record for the longest public speaking marathon by a team, which means that they spoke nonstop for 36 hours with basically no breaks and no sleep uh, to promote their book and to raise funds for nonprofits. In today's episode, Keith shares his journey from running a successful digital agency to becoming a thought leader in the space of personal development. He shares the creation and the philosophy behind the Oak Journal, which is a 90-day tool that really helps you to achieve significant goals through positive psychology and structured goal setting. I use one myself. I'm a huge fan of the Oak Journal. Today, we also talk about the power of gratitude in creating the life you want, how to build great habits and make them stick, how EO, Entrepreneur Organization, was a big support to Keith along his journey, and how ancient wisdom can be applied to life in the 21st century. So with that, let's dive into another episode of the Conscious Entrepreneur Podcast. Thanks for being here. Hey, Keith Roberts, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It's great to see you. Hey, Alex, it's good to see you, my friend. Thanks for having me. You've had a pretty eventful start to 2024. Uh, You released a book recently, and you also just did a gigantic marathon talk, which yielded, if I'm correct, a new Guinness Book of World Records as it relates to uh, length of a single speech or a single marathon talk. Tell us about what that was all about. Yeah, it was uh, Guinness Record for the longest public speaking marathon by a team of two. And we did it for two reasons. Uh, you know, Ryan Avery and myself just completed the book, The Eternal Flame, which is a historical fiction. And uh, it, it, it's about a, a woman who lived 700 years ago and it's lessons in leadership. And so we wanted to do something to really promote um, this in a different way. And Ryan is a holder of a couple dozen Guinness World Records. Uh, he's actually my my mentor in speaking. And so we thought, let's do a public speaking marathon. And we donated all the proceeds from sales during that 36 hours we spoke to Girls Inc. and Free Tibet. So we paired it with a charity. uh, And we spoke for a day and a half nonstop. There couldn't be more than a 30-second break. Uh, It was a really cool undertaking and uh, super fun, like when the cannons go off and they actually hand you the record. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, And so this was probably drawing on a big reservoir of energy and information and stories for you. How did you guys prep for this? (laughs) Um, we dri- well, just a lot of notes of different stories we wanted to take. The, the two main rules was there couldn't be more than a 30 second pause and we couldn't repeat any content. So I've got, you know, four one hour keynotes and okay. we also couldn't use slides. So I went through my keynotes in my first two hour stretch and we alternated two hours. Uh, but Ryan's done a lot of these. So he was, he was very smart. He had a bunch of boxes of questions. So anybody in the audience could ask us a question and then yeah. we would just make lists of stories to tell. So we didn't, it didn't have to be, you know, uh, an earth shattering motivational speech. We just couldn't stop speaking. It's like, um, it's like a filibuster in the Senate, a really long one. But, but in the truest sense of the words, like you used to have to filibuster where you had to stand up and talk. So it was, it was a blast. It was the, like the worst jet lag I've ever had the week afterwards. But, um, I have to say it wasn't. It was actually the audience. Some of the requirements, we had to have 10 people in the audience at all times, plus a timekeeper, plus a uh, witness and making sure at three in the morning, you know, there because if, if we fell below for, you know, one minute, somebody went to the bathroom, the world record was over. Everything was filmed. Um, it was all live streamed. So it was fun. And I probably told some stories if it wasn't three in the morning and I just needed to keep talking that I wouldn't have told. <laughs> And so what was the total elapsed time? What what is now the longest record for a two person marathon talk? Thirty six hours. The previous record was thirty hours and six minutes, but we chose thirty six because one, if you're gonna break it, I don't want somebody else to break it in like two weeks. Um, but also it was the combined age of all four of our children and the book was dedicated to our kids. 
So if you're listening to this podcast and you find yourself enthusiastic about going to break your Guinness World Record of Marathon talking by two people, you now have to get it above 36 hours. So that's uh, that's that's quite an accomplishment. Congratulations. And Thanks, this brother. was, as you said, this was all in support of your new book, The Eternal Flame. Tell us about how you and Ryan came up with that. I know that it's sort of a parable. It's kind of a it's kind of a, a modern leadership parable told with a historical context and historical characters. How did you guys come up with that? And, and what are the things that you're hoping people to take away from the book? Uh, it, it came up over vegan sushi, which I do not recommend. But Ryan is vegan. And we met after sort of the lockdown. And we're, we're catching up. I hadn't seen him since before COVID. And I had always wanted to write a book. He published three. I've written eight, published none. And we started talking about my keynotes. And he's, even though he's much younger than me, he's kind of my mentor with public speaking. And I gave him my elevator pitch and he said, that's way too long. Um, and then I, I hit the term bodhisattva, which is my goal in this life to be a bodhisattva. I'm a Buddhist, you know this. And, uh, he's like, that's it, man. You, that should be your, you know, what you are, you know, and, and it kind of worked out perfectly because the Zen man was my agency and I was able to keep the URL after the acquisition and it transitioned into, um, sort of my, my back to my nickname, um, and so the idea of writing a book about a bodhisattva came up over vegan sushi. And then we decided, ironically, as two middle-aged white guys, it should be out of a woman. There needs to be more books about women leaders. Uh, so we chose a woman. And one of my favorite parts about it, you know, I'm, I've been Buddhist for almost 30 years. Ryan is not. But as we wrote this historical fiction 700 years ago in Tibet, uh, you know, triple checking everything. I actually learned a lot about the first Dalai Lama and what the city of Lhasa was like 700 years ago. And, you know, as we were writing the story, we wanted to make it very, very accurate. Just that for me was a ton of fun. The only thing that's not accurate historically in the book is where a mala comes from, but it's kind of the, the really cool sixth sense ending to the book. So we took a little liberty in uh, the, the creation of the mala necklace. And how did you decide to do this in that format as opposed to, hey, I'm Keith Roberts, I've got this Zen man bodhisattva thing I want to get out into the world and I'm just going to talk about my content and my ideas. How did you choose that mechanism? Because it's, it's fairly unique. You don't see it that often. Pat Lencioni does stuff like that, but it tends not to be historical fiction. It's just kind of, kind of you know, sitting in a boardroom telling a story. So a lot of people have done those. Uh, Sri Kumar Rao, of course, who's been on this podcast, uh, has a tremendous amount of this ancient wisdom that he's also bringing to the world, but he tends to not use quite as many of those um, uh, stories, at least ones that he makes up. He sort of repurposes existing ones that you might have heard from, heard of and, and mm -hmm. reframes them. So how did you decide, okay, we're going to do this with an entirely uh, you know, new genre of fictionalized historical characters from a long time ago? Um, it's probably a combination of a few things. I think one of the best books is uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. And it's like comic book thick. And it's this great historical fiction where you learn the lessons of gold through the protagonist. Um, another one of my favorite books of all time is She's Come Undone, ironically written by a man about a woman who, uh, when she was a little girl, her father left. She sort of gets locked away in her room with you know Twinkies and becomes obese and then goes to college, has this profound experience with a beached whale, changes her life. Uh, it's an incredible story about a woman's uh, dealing with, with a weight challenge that she had since she was a little girl and it was written okay. by a man. So we thought, man, if this, if somebody can, can really, um, articulate these challenges in such a beautiful way that you'd never guess it wasn't written by a woman that had personally experienced this, um, let's take on this challenge of, you know, coming up with a woman protagonist. Uh, and then I have a good friend, Namgal Sherpa from uh, Nepal, and his sister's name is Dawa. And so we, used, we chose Dawa as the mm -hmm. protagonist's name as a little mm -hmm. um, homage to his family. Very cool. Great. Uh, and and so really fun to see those two things come to life or be be created, be birthed by you in, in 2024. Those are both big goals. So writing a book and then delivering this this groundbreaking talk are really big goals. And I know that for you, developing and encouraging the science of goal setting and then hitting goals is a really big deal. I mean, you've gone so far as not only to talk about this a lot in your work in life and do keynotes on it, but you've also created the Oak Journal. I've got mine right here. I love the Oak Journal. You've got yours right there. 
And, and these are incredible tools for people who are looking to uh, kind of, you know, across their, let me summarize what I think this is all about. Okay. And, and you can tell me where I've got gaps. It's a great way to sort of look at all the different aspects of my life. So family, personal, business, what are my goals? What are the things that I'm trying to accomplish? How do I create uh, some structure and clarity in my thought? And then what are the things I need to do over a fairly defined period of time, 90 days, so basically a quarter of a year, what, what is it that I need to do? How do I get my thoughts organized and together? And so Oak Journal is a great tool for me and for many other entrepreneurs. And you're obviously living the process. So you, you, you do it yourself. So this allows you to be extremely productive in, in your life. Um, but let's take a step back and tell us about the journal and the process and how that came to be. Okay. Uh, first, I'll tell you how it came to be. Um, as you knew, no, I ran an agency I started in 1998 for over two decades called Zen Man. And we were a digital shop. And uh, about 15 years into running the business, I joined Entrepreneurs Organization. Absolutely changed my life. I learned how to become an entrepreneur. The first 15 years, I was just too stubborn to fail. And I'd work 120 hours if that's what was needed. And then through Yo, I had this amazing opportunity to do a program at MIT called the Entrepreneur Master's Program. And after the first week, uh, I had this epiphany that I was trading my time for money and it was mm -hmm. a really bad deal. And even though, you know, I was a really high paid, uh, creative, it, it was still a bad deal. And so I took all of the learnings from EMP, from EO, and then my practices as a Buddhist and as an entrepreneur. And I started bullet journaling them into this format. And that turned into the product that's the Oak Journal that, you know, that you use now and that, that I love and adore. And I'm very grateful to anybody that embraces. You don't really need the journal to do it. You just need the process. You know, writing things down, double the probability of accomplishing it. The one thing the journal does is it bundles, uh, as you mentioned, personal business and family or relationship goals. Because we are a three-legged stool, right? If business is crushing it, but you're neglecting your health, eventually that's going to impact you in a very negative way stool will become unbalanced and fall over. Mm -hmm. And then it's a format for setting those goals, stating the goals, creating the roadmap. And then most importantly, you know, having a mantra, visualizing it, and then really feeling what's it going to be like to accomplish it at 90 days. And then once we've, you know, set those smart goals, simple, measurable, uh, attainable, relevant, and time bound, then there's a daily structure to help you make continuous progress every single day for 90 days. And if you're just making 1% progress, you're going to get there, you know, in 12 weeks, no problem. Um, and then at the end of every week, there's a retrospective, which I completely ripped off and duplicated from agile software development, my days of the agency, where we just look at the, the week and what held us back, what pushed us forward, what puzzled us. And we create another high level roadmap that informs the following week. And the last thing I chucked in there was every week there's a closing exercise based on positive psychology that is meant to serve as your compass, right? It's um, it's great to see somebody speak and to get motivated or buy a book on the shelf and start, but it's not the starting that matters. Stop starting and start finishing. You've got to finish the book. And so those weekly tools are meant to just keep you inspired and you know pull you along rather than try to push you to completion. I love the way that it's it it has the structure and then it's prompting you with these questions. So it's not just like the same thing over and over. It's saying, Hey, reflect back and think about this, or here's a theme um, and that sort of thing. Because one of the ways that people struggle sometimes with implementing these is it feels kind of formulaic and it's like, okay, I, I get this after a short period of time. You're obviously pattern interrupting that with, with psychology and with, with tools here to help keep us motivated and to help keep us on the path. In what way is that changing how people are using the tool and the results that they're getting. I think the flexibility in that and that it's not, you know, it's not so binary actually gives people the grace to adopt it into their system. Right. I mean, the, the two things that I think are the most important, you know, one, every, every journal under the sun has gratitude and there's just science behind how it reduces our cortisol. It increases our serotonin and oxytocin. It helps us, you know, be aligned with our intentions those things I wouldn't give up. And then the one thing that's unique to the Oak Journal that I would say is is really a game changer is the 10-10-10. Um, you know, one of my mentors, Warren Rustan, taught me this actually at the uh, EMP program. Um, and it's 10 minutes of meditation, 10 minutes of reading, 10 minutes of journaling. Uh, and I do that every day religiously. I've got about a two-hour morning routine when I'm at home. 
Um, I do 30 minutes of reading, 30 minutes of meditation, and 10 minutes of journaling. Um, but just having that practice has absolutely changed my life. And I think one of the ways, and I'm actually reading a book on uh, manifestation, it's called Transurfing right now, is just, you know, aligning the frequency and what you're putting out in the world, right? What vibrations, what you're attracting, what you're manifesting, that abundance versus scarcity mindset. You're doing that every single day by your gratitude and then journaling positive thoughts. Like you mentioned, every day has a prompt and it's not, you know, what's frustrating you today, right? Every single one of them is intentionally <laughs> positive to help you, um, you know, have that right mindset and, you know, be vibrating at the frequency that's going to attract your best life. The, the gratitude thing really is such an in interesting word, big concept these days. Everyone's talking about it. And, you know, the way that, the way that I've heard this described is, uh, I've been to several of the, uh, sort of week long meditation retreats with Dr. Joe Dispenza, who does these incredible meditation programs. Uh, and they're, yes. they're really, really powerful. And one of the things that he always says is he says, gratitude is the ultimate form of receivership. And so you think about that. It's like, well, what does that mean? And then, and then the, the way that he phrases it is when I'm grateful for something, it means that it's already in my life. And yes. it's a, it's a way of sort of reframing and tricking the brain, which doesn't actually know the difference between real life and a thought. So it's like yes. tricking the brain and saying, this has already happened. So whatever goal I have, whatever wish I have, let's assume it's already there. Feel what that's like, get that in the body. And that then creates the chemical state of our body that allows us to feel the gratitude. One of the mistakes that I used to make, and I've seen many other people make, is think that gratitude is like a checklist. Like, I'm grateful yeah. that the sun came up this morning. I'm grateful that I'm breathing. I'm grateful for this or that. You know, and people are just like kind of doing it as a mental exercise, as opposed to like really, really getting into it. What did you find in terms of like explaining gratitude to people or getting that message across? I mean, you, you touched on a couple really essential points. The only things I would add to it is you know, I would tell everybody, if you repeat something you're grateful for, you're getting diminishing returns. The more specific you can be with your gratitude, the better the ROI is going to get as far as the neurotransmitters. And then lastly, if you can't think of something to be grateful for, remember that there are a billion people today that don't have access to safe drinking water. 700 million people that don't have access to electricity. You know, one of the biggest problems with respiratory illness is the fact that people are using fires to heat and cook in their homes. Um, we are so incredibly blessed. So if you can't think of something to be grateful for, think of what you have that other people could only dream of. Yeah. When I hear people say, I don't know what to be grateful for. It's like, well, I think we can get a little bit more creative here, man. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and we could be more specific, right? So it's not just that I have safe drinking water on the tap, but I have, you know, beautiful single source artisan coffee that was, uh, you know, picked up from my house at a great shop right around the corner. And I'm so grateful for this cup of coffee this morning. Um, that just makes my day start off on a bright note. And is articulating this or writing it down a key to it? Or can I just feel it? I obviously can't just think it and check it off in my head. So like, what's the mechanism to get it out to make it most effective? <clears throat> It's, it's writing it down. And, and that's one of the things, right? There's, there's different levels of return, right? Like I have friends who digest hundreds of audiobooks a year because they're listening to them in their car, but they're retaining one to 2% of that book versus, you know, I'm a physical book. I'm a vinyl. I'm a very analog dude. Um, mm -hmm. and you just science shows you retain more if you read the physical book. And they've shown in studies, if I listen to the audiobook while I'm reading the physical book, it exponentially increases my retention. The other thing that I do, I stole this from Ryan Holiday. Um, you know, when I'm reading a book, I go through and anything that I find helpful, I highlight, I put a little tab on it. And then once I've completed the book, I go back and I write all of those notes on index cards and I file them, whether it's on benefit of meditation or intention setting or cold exposure. And so I have this, um, wealth of knowledge but the funny thing is alex i never have to go back to the index cards because i've stopped and i've highlighted it because i went back afterwards and wrote it down it's committed to memory um so the box just sit there and collect dust until i finish a book and i'm adding the next card uh that's still a great it's still a great habit it's a great thing to do for, for me i'll just share a total side note for me i started using the the library a lot here in boulder and so where i used to buy books 
and then read them and keep them on my bookshelf and then be able to see them in the future, you know, see them again and be like, oh yeah, I remember that book. I remember what it was all about. Now I return them to the library. And so my recall of books is like gone way, 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 way down. And so really? just another example of your the kind of the repetition, like, did I see the title again? Did I think, oh yeah, I remember the, the concepts here because I'm returning it. Yeah, I, like it just—it's not staying as 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 a big a part of my life. Anyway, I don't I don't want to digress into my particular reading <laughs> habits there, but I. So this is just to reinforce the point that uh, there are ways that we can do to to get better at this stuff. And I like that you brought up Ryan Holiday, as as you know, and and uh, listeners of this podcast know he's the keynote speaker at this year's Conscious Entrepreneur Summit. We're recording this about three weeks before the summit, so by the time it airs, uh, the summit will have come and gone. But what I want to talk to you about is stoic philosophy and this yeah. is a big deal for people. So uh, the reason that we we decided we'd love to have Ryan holiday come this year to the event is because stoicism came up so many times in conversations with people. I mean, literally everybody is always referring to it. How do I act in, you know, in a way that's in my best interest? How do I show up as my best self? How do I respond to whatever is happening to the world around me? Um, those, like those are some of the critical tenets. Like, how do I do right? How do I how do I act in a right way? How do I stay true to my values? Um, and you know, because being an entrepreneur, as uh, as you know, can feel like getting punched in the face ten times a day. Uh, it's really important to have those types of tools at your disposal. So, I would just love to hear how you have incorporated stoicism into your life, or what drew you to that in particular. I mean, it, it actually started with Ryan. So, you know, uh, Daily Stoic, Ego is the Enemy, Obstacle is the Way were the first few books I read of his and really adopted his philosophy. And one of the things I also do when I read books, and this happened with Ryan, um, he'll reference a book. He'll reference Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. So not only will I highlight it, I'll pull up my phone, I'll put it in my Amazon, and yeah. I'll order it. And, and you maybe can see, but, you know, behind me, that's my that's my to read pile next to my nice. shelf there. So there's literally four piles of books, uh, you know, high enough that you can set coffee on them. And I just keep adding to that. Um, the, my favorite Stoic saying ironically is not one of the classic Stoics. It's a golden era Hollywood actress who said, what other people think of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, the reason that that's my favorite Stoic setting, even though it's from like the 50s, uh, is two things. One, it uh, doesn't matter what people think of you, right? You're going to act different, behave different. You're going to put on a chameleon uh, persona if you're worried about what other people are thinking about you. And two, I think the most important is we won't try things if we feel judged by others. Maybe I won't write that song, publish that book, create that painting if I'm worried that people are going to judge me. And so even more than what people are actually thinking of me in the moment, I think it's that limiting belief that stops you from being creative. And, and, and we are all creative. Some people just don't understand how to tap into their creativity or unique gifts. Uh, I mean, that sounds like full flare up of imposter syndrome right there. I'm worried about what, what other people are going to think. In some cases, I'm even forecasting a negative reaction in the future for something I haven't done yet. So I'm not going to bother doing that. <laughs> I'll give you two examples. And one, Alex, I, I regret to say I haven't acted on and you can hold me accountable. Um, I've never applied for Mensa. Um, a test that I took when I was a kid put me right on the cusp, a couple points shy of being able to qualify. But because I didn't want to not get accepted, I've never took a test uh, to see if I could qualify for Mensa. Exact same situation. You know, I, I do a ton of keynote speaking. I speak for a lot of YPO chapters, but I never applied to be a YPO certified speaker because I didn't want to get rejected. I applied two days ago. I was accepted in 20 hours. Um, and, <laughs> you know, if they'd rejected me, at least I would have tried. But um, I need to take that Mensa test. Well, congratulations <laughs> on YPO. And yes, next time we talk, I look forward to hearing about the uh, the results of that of that test. Um, I just want to switch back to the to the goal setting here for for a second. So, we talked about the the power of being grateful as as a process and being structured in writing down what do I want, how am I going to get there, reinforcing the patterns and reinforcing the ways of thinking, and then being holistic about this. So it's family, personal, business, health. You know, really taking a wide view of of the person, which we have to do. We can't. We can't just do one and not the other. And we all know the story about the 
juggling balls and one are, one some are glass and some are rubber and you know that sort of thing. Um, but I, I know that I've heard you talk uh, in the past about uh, kind of forming habits and the power of forming habits because a lot of entrepreneurs that I talk to, a lot of people I talk to, they're like, hey, I want to get healthier. I want to get better at this. Or I want to do that. And, and everyone just goes on a tear to make these huge commitments. We're going to do X, Y, and Z and do all this type of stuff. Um, and then they don't get there and yeah. they fall into this trap. I think you call it the two X rule. Basically yeah. the idea is like, you know, there's a limit to how many times you can give, you take the day off if you're really trying to be effective at building a habit. What's that all about? You, you touched, you hit it exactly on the head, Alex. It's if, you know, say I want to lose weight, right. And I've got two goals. I want to work out or at least hit my 10,000 steps every day. And I want to not eat a bunch of sugar. Um, I set those as goals. I track those goals. What gets tracked gets done, but we are human. We are imperfect. So when we go out to dinner uh, at Luca here in Denver and they have this ridiculously good tiramisu and we enjoy it, um, it doesn't mean I just throw my diet out the window. It means, hey, tomorrow I need to be impeccable. If tomorrow we you know, start our day at Lucille's and I eat you know, four beignets for breakfast, now it's over. So the 2X rule is don't go two consecutive days either um, doing something or not doing something that you're trying to create as a habit. The other thing I would say is habit stacking. Uh, as you mentioned, a lot of people, they try to change everything, especially around New Year's resolutions, right? I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to read a book a week. Uh, I'm going to save 50% of my income. They set all of these goals right. that are not attainable. They're not realistic. Um, and then very quickly, they become deflated. People have the same impact uh, or effect with meditation. So many people that I talk to that don't meditate, that have tried it, say, well, I tried it and, you know, thoughts enter my mind. I can't, I'm not a good meditator. That's not the case. You are a good meditator. Everybody is. Thoughts enter everyone's mind. I promise you this morning when the Dalai Lama was meditating, thoughts entered his mind mm -hmm. and he just went back to his meditation. And that's what I love about, you know, transcendental meditation, Vedic meditation is it teaches you that process of thoughts are going to enter your mind. That's your brain de-stressing itself, untwisting the knots. Um, and just as soon as you realize it, you know, that's right. You, you're meditating. And I go back to my mantra. The, the two X thing, the, the, the reason that this is important. So here's what I think is a, is, is a false mental model that people make. They assume like, let's, let's take this diet example that you were just talking about. So maybe I have a, you know, one day where I'm like, oh, you know, I eat too much and whatever. And the next day is the same. Um, we think we're doing ourselves a favor by, cheating so to speak or we think that we're we think that uh the good thing to do is to not have is to have the next meal at lucille's like you were talking about i have the beignets or whatever it is in reality the better thing to do for ourselves is to stay on track or to get back on track to say hey it's okay i built this into my schedule that once a week or whatever it is i'm gonna i'm gonna be slightly off target that's fine the long-term benefit of continuing is way, way better than the sh tiny short-term gain I'm going to get from breaking it again on day two and then potentially falling off this habit and not being able to do it going forward. But so many people, we, we get stuck in this like short-term view of it that says, if I take the reward immediately, that's better than setting myself up for the long-term benefits and success. That's, by the way, behind the stoic and Ryan holidays, like discipline is destiny idea of like, yeah. we are our habits. We are what we do on a daily basis, but it's so interesting to see like that natural pull to be like, Oh, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to go back to default mode and I'm not going to stick with it. And it can have really negative impacts going forward. Once you see the compounding benefit of sticking to your habit. Yeah. I, Two, two things come up to me when you were saying that, Alex. One is choose your heart, right? Like it's hard to not be in healthy shape, not be able to go hiking or do the activities you want, but it's also hard to make sure you're active enough and you eat right, especially if we're on the road or, you know, with kids or busy lifestyle. So choose your heart. And then I'll say three things. The other is, um, you know, our, our willpower and our discipline atrophy throughout the day. So it's much easier when you're at the store to not pick up those double stuffed Oreo cookies once have the discipline, then buy them and say, well, I I'll only eat them in special occasions, but then you have them in the kitchen. And every time you walk in there, you have to use your discipline. Um, and then the last thing is what would myself 10 years ago think about this decision 10 years from now, sorry, mm. in the future, would they be happy with the decision I'm making? 
um, I saw a speaker once and I'm, I'm not to his level yet, uh, be able to do this, but he talked about if knowledge equaled results, everybody would have six pack abs. Uh, and then he's able to pull up his shirt and he's got like an eight pack, right? So it's, <laughs> it's not that we know what to do. It's that we actually take the action and probably the best, um, historical case study or that example is the, uh, expedition for the South pole, the two expeditions, uh, Raoul Amelson and Robert Falcon Scott, they both set out at the same time. Actually, Scott was a more decorated, um, explorer. He'd done a couple expeditions into the Amazon and was a member of the Royal Geographic Society. But when conditions were bad, they would try to wait out the storm. Whereas the Norwegians, Amelson's group, they would always try to make uh, 20 miles progress, many days making it less than a mile. But every day, no matter how bad it was, they did something. And of course, they reached the South Pole three and a half weeks before um, the British and the British did eventually get there, but they tragically perished uh, on the return. So it was for them a matter of life and death. And, you know, you and I know this. I know Travis is speaking to this um, at this year's summit, but today's a gift. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. You know, this life is is incredible. So what are we going to do today to be the best version of ourselves? Yeah, uh, for for sure. And so so you're referring to Travis Luther, who is giving a talk on life lessons from the terminally ill uh, at yes. the Conscious Entrepreneur Summit. Major, major, uh, important, meaningful topic. Uh, and, in, you know, memento mori, we are going to die. And what are we doing with the life that we have, which we do not long, know how long it will last? Uh, exactly. I want to, I want to, I want to back up in your career and I want to, I want to find out what it was like for you to be an entrepreneur without the tools that you have today. So you said that you started Zen Man a good long while ago as a marketing agency. And it yeah. was only through your work with the entrepreneur organization and with, uh, some of the, for example, the program at MIT that you learned some of the things that you're now applying, like building the Oak Journal and the power of gratitude and habits and, and stuff like that. Um, walk us through what it was like to, build the company to be running it for over 15 years and then to finally decide, Hey, you know, this is not something I want to be continuing with anymore. Tell us about that journey. The reason I'm asking is so many entrepreneurs uh, are, you know, they start off thinking, Hey, three years and I'm going to get acquired by Google. And then, you know, <laughs> we're done. Uh, that's often not the case, right? So these do tend to really stretch out for people and it stretches your internal resources as well. So it's not just time. It's also, uh, your own resilience, your own willpower uh, type of thing. So everything always takes longer than expected. Um, you've lived through this. You did wind up uh, selling and exiting the company. Um, tell us about how that whole kind of thing looked like for you from a high-level view. Um, okay, from a high-level view. Well, the first 15 years before EO, again, it was just stubbornness and, you know, the I was pushing a rock up the hill, I'm going to make this yeah. work. I mean, literally, literally one night for, for e-bags, I was finishing their catalog. I had pneumonia in one lung. I had to check myself out of the hospital, get a four pack of Red Bull and a big thing of Aguala orange juice and pull an all nighter finishing their Christmas catalog. Uh, and I didn't realize it, but three months later, my neighbor two doors down died of pneumonia. I actually didn't realize how significantly I was, I was risking my health and my life by doing that. So it truly would do anything. Um, and then after EO, that's when I really, you know, I learned things like EBITDA, which I should have known before I started a business, right? But I was a creative. Um, and I, I learned how to be a leader, you know, tools like EOS, um, the program at MIT, my EO forum, and just growing through other people's experiences and the way they shared it. But the biggest epiphany for me was selling the agency. You know, I, I had that same thing, right? I'm going to build it. I'm going to sell it to Google before I'm 40. I'm going to move to Nepal and just live in a hut with this monk and meditate. Um, that didn't happen. Uh, but I built it to the point that it became my identity. And when I was trying to come up with my personal why, I kept framing it through the lens of this agency that had become my identity. Uh, and my why is not selling more frontier airlines tickets or houses for Remax or, you know, Bijou, uh, which is this like Chinese moonshine, but it's the, the best, the biggest selling liquor in the world. Uh, we did a site for them. So it didn't have anything to do with what I built. And I had to get over this concept of sunk equity and realize that that was a chat. It wasn't even a chapter. It was a volume 
and I like to think of life as a trilogy and that was just volume one. And now I'm on to, you know, um, the, the next volume in my trilogy. So you started to realize, Hey, the equity here is sunk equity, meaning it's not, it's what I do today is not impacted by what I did yesterday or whatever I have in the business. Uh, what, what am I doing with my time, energy and talents as of this moment forward? Sounds like the reframe there. Yeah. And it was not easy because even after, as I was selling the agency, I had, you know, friends and family that didn't understand that perspective. Like, Hey, you've built, you've built a, a comfortable life. You know, they didn't see the, the blood, sweat and tears and the losing 30 pounds going through a lawsuit with a subcontractor that you're suing over them stealing from you or, you know, all the, the bad stuff, right? They just see mm-hmm. the, the outside. Um, and really discouraging, like, how can you walk away from you know, literally my whole adult life? I, I built this company, uh, but it wasn't walking away. It was a great opportunity. It was an acquisition through another EOer that was uh, a strategic acquisition for their company that helped them expand the United States. It allowed me to not just turn the lights off, right, but actually, you know, step into the next chapter of my life. I, I stayed on for a year and a half and helped them with the transition. Uh, but it was tough. It was really hard to separate my business from my identity. And then after the acquisition, um, I didn't want to have that. What, what does it all mean now? I'm nothing without my business. And so I, I had an intentional, you know, plant medicine ceremony in Joshua tree and burned my last business card and sort of, you know, all right, this is the next chapter of my life and and really embraced it. And I actually didn't have that downside. Like I've talked to, you know, I think you're friends with Aaron too. Um, you know, after he'd sort of, you know, sold, um, his, his enormous exit, but then, you know, what's, where's my happiness now? Where's my happiness now is a big question, especially because we get so like sucked into our companies. We become, Oh, you're Keith from Zen man. Oh, like this is what you do. And, uh, when we believe that too much, it's super hard to, to, to divorce those two identities. Uh, I like the process of burning your last business card going forward. How did it feel? Like literally, like how did it feel that next day when you woke up and you're like, oh, my email doesn't work anymore or like people are no longer calling me? <laughs> uh, well, it was an easy transition for me because my last day of my earnout, I was on my way to Burning Man. Uh, and so there was no contacting me <laughs> for 10 days. I was off the grid. And it was this like amazing, like, wow, I'm really, you know, going off onto the playa completely severed of all uh, strings that were tying me to that business. Um, the nice thing is I actually got to keep the URL, um, you know, the company that acquired me. Um, I let them know I'm, I'm writing a book called Becoming Zen Man. It's one of the eight that I wrote before the final ninth was published. And they let me keep it. It's funny. My, my attorney, my M&A attorney, when I said, can you try to see if they'll let us keep the domain said, there's no effing way, but it doesn't hurt to ask. So mm-hmm. I appreciate I appreciate his setting expectations, but also going through and yeah. So you can still reach me at my Zen Man email. Right, fantastic. <laughs> uh, so Keith, as we as we wrap up here, you know, it's getting toward the middle of the year, and I'm curious to hear your practices or recommendations for ending the year strong. Everybody talks about New Year's resolutions. Nobody talks about mid year resolutions. But since you've got all this process around. Uh, goal setting and really good hygiene around habit development and so on. What are the types of things that you would typically be encouraging people to think about in the summertime, in June and July, when things are a little bit slower to really set themselves up for a strong end to the year? Uh, There are a couple things, you know, one, as you know, with the Oak Journal, you're resetting goals every 90 days. But one thing that I'm actually going through the process of doing right now is creating a vision board. Uh, which might seem kind of silly and childish, but it's incredibly powerful in manifesting. And it's very easy to say in the future, um, you know, what life is going to look like, but there's a, a process and there's many people that have it, you know, Finney and Kelly's intentional path. There's Cameron Harrell's uh, vivid vision. There's painted picture, but basically answering a, a series of questions that what is my life going to look like in 10 years? Um, and when you go through this process now, mid year is a great time to revisit it. And I've got mine actually, I have it literally right here on the shelf. Um, and I've got a picture of the retreat where we did it on. And then on the back of it, I've got my vivid vision that I did October 22nd in Halifax, Canada. And I go through and can look at, you know, who are the people in my life? 
How do my children talk about me to their most trusted? What does my calendar look like? What am I the most proud of? And just revisiting this. Um, writing it down in the first place doubles the probability of accomplishing it. But being able to go back and just reset expectations, recalibrate, um, and just retrospective it. Again, like the agile software development. What's holding me back? What's working? What's pushing me forward? And then how can I grow and continue to evolve my processes? Um, yeah, but constantly looking at ourselves. And the other thing I would say is when doing that, and this is really important, um, never compare yourself to anybody else, just yourself yesterday. So when I look at my painted picture that I did uh, in 2022, if I compare myself to the guys in that photo, I am going to feel horrible. You know, Daniel had a $50 million exit. When I call him, he's on the horse farm that he bought for his wife because she's into horses. One of the other guys is worth half a billion dollars in real estate. Um, I am an ant compared to their businesses. Uh, but if I compare myself to where I was, I feel really good about it. And that's just, it's a recipe for disaster when you start comparing yourself to others. For sure. hundred percent. That, that is definitely one of the demons that uh, we all face is, is comparison. I want to make one final point on this writing stuff down. Uh, when you write stuff down, so part of it is saying, okay, here's my goal and I'm going to get that down on paper. Uh, a big part of what it does, and I want you to, to reflect on this or correct me if, if I'm wrong about this, but I think a big part of what it does is it can trigger your nervous system into saying, okay, I can actually do this. Because there's the mental process of like, yes, I can dream up some, some future. If I write it down, especially if I repeat writing it down and I continue to revisit the goal, writing it down, rereading it, writing it down over the course of many days, I'm actually training my nervous system to believe that this stuff is happening too, that this is something that I can do, which takes yeah. it out of the idea of like, oh, this <clears> is just like a moonshot and I probably won't get there and it's probably not realistic, but I'm just going to do it because Keith told me so, et cetera. But writing it down consistently actually calms our nervous system down and opens up the possibility of these things happening. That's how I've heard it described before. Did I get that right? Yeah, I would be very, very accurate. And the only things that I would add to that, studies have shown, even if you just write something down only once, that the probability of it coming to fruition is 43%. And they've done this where people write down their goals for the year, uh, January 1, put those goals in an envelope, put that envelope in a safe. They don't look at it until December 31st, 43%. You can Google it. There's multiple studies on this. Mm -hmm. The other thing, if you don't want to use the Google machine, is if you're a parent, you know, do you have paintings that your kids created framed around your house? When you come to my house, I have literally spent thousands of dollars framing what is arguably pretty bad art because... There was love that was transferred when, you know, Quinn do that painting of me and him camping at the crystal mill, right? So it's, it's also the emotion that's transferred that helps in that, you know, making it come to reality. Fantastic. Well, hey, Keith, great to hear from you. Thanks for the tour uh, through not only your personal journey, but also helping to set everyone else up here for success with the Oak Journal and your goal setting methods. It's great to see you. And thanks for joining the Conscious Entrepreneur Podcast. Good to see you, my friend. Have a great day, Alex. Thanks for the time. Thank you.